All eyes on China and the now global health emergency surrounding the coronavirus, of course. But for Canada, that's only the latest complication with that country. Relations between China and Canada have been at an historic low since Canada detained the Huawei executive, who the United States wants to extradite back to their country. Then China plucked two Canadians off the streets and tossed them in prison. They're still there. And to top it off, China is demanding that Canada let Huawei join its 5G wireless network. The U.S. is pressuring Canada to say, no, ban Huawei. Meantime, the United Kingdom just made their own decision last week, giving a partial green light to Huawei to build selected parts of its communication system. What should Canada do? Follow the UK or ban Huawei? And are strained diplomatic relations hampering Canada's efforts to deal with the coronavirus? Let's bring in the scrum to talk about that. Annie Bergeron Oliver is a parliamentary reporter right here at CTV News. Stephanie Levitz is a reporter for the Canadian Press. Tonda McCharles is a senior reporter for the Toronto Star. And our special guest for this round is the former CSIS director and former national security advisor to Prime Ministers Harper and Trudeau, uh, Richard Fadden. Great to see everybody uh, this morning. Let me just start with you, uh, Dick Fadden. What do you make of the, the UK sort of half and half deal? We'll let you in part way. Should Canada follow that? I think this was an honest effort on their, part, on their part to balance off everything and to try and come out with something that's reasonable. I don't think we should follow their example for a whole variety of reasons, but the main one is I don't think it's Canada and the UK are comparable. Uh, the risk that Huawei presents to the, to the United States is greater in the case of Canada because we're proximate to them. The interoperability of our communication systems is almost absolute. Not true in the case of the UK. So if we let Huawei in, we may be endangering their national security, let alone ours. So I think you add that to a variety of other reasons. I would say UK, their call, I think it's a mistake because I don't think they can guarantee protection against the Chinese, but I don't think we should go that route. Steph. You know, it's interesting, right, in the last couple of days, the U.S., as though they've been pressuring the U.K., they've also sent signals now that they're willing to work with the U.K. to find some sort of security compromise that helps out the U.K. I find that interesting. But you have, you know, the U.S. saying no to Huawei, the British going halfway with Huawei, and we are where with Huawei is mm. the question. What, how does this fit into our, our general national... China policy, because there's elements of this, you know, the, the Huawei will say we're not state controlled, but as you say in your intro, China is pressuring Canada. It, be, it becomes a national, international foreign policy issue. It's not a business issue. And what does that mean for the Canadian government going forward? And I think that Canada now has to make a decision because we are the final group of the five eyes that has not made a decision on this. So, you know, we've waited it out. We have to make a decision at some point so that people stop asking, is Canada going to jump in? Are we not going to? And I think what this British decision does is it allows us to see if the Americans will actually follow through. As Steph was saying, initially, the, the Americans were saying, we're not going to work with anybody who is saying yes to Huawei. So how do the Americans follow through with this? Are they going to still work with the Brits? Are they going to give them some compromise? And then I think the question also becomes, well, how, how solid is our evidence about whether allowing Huawei into the core network or into the peripheries, what does mm. that make a difference? And because if you talk to tech experts or security, they say allowing somebody into the core or the periphery, it doesn't matter. It's all the same. They still have access. And just to remind, I just want to remind our, our viewers real quick, the Five Eyes is the intelligence sharing group, which is the UK, the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and that's what you talk about, which is the sensitive group. And Tell I would guess that the UK is a greater contributor to that intelligence network that's than true. Canada mm -hmm. is. Uh, so it's interesting because that intelligence relationship with the US, there's more at stake. Uh, the Brits have more leverage with the U US, and perhaps that's why the US is prepared to work with them. But look, I don't think actually there is agreement among experts of, as to whether Huawei can or cannot participate. Mm -hmm. Certainly the telecoms among themselves disagree. Uh, certain telecom countries, uh, companies in this country think that Huawei can be a part, that ripping it out it makes no sense whatsoever. It's just being uh, giving a sop to the U.S. So uh, I don't mind that Canada is taking its time with this. And furthermore, I actually think that Canada is really between a rock and a hard place on this one because of the two uh, Canadians who are detained in, j in that jail. If Canada now acts to ban ro Huawei, I really think they will be punting this decision. But if they act now to ban Huawei and give the U.S. what it wants, in fact, Canada will pay a greater price and Canada has still so, not won any of those battles. If I were the National Security Advisor today, I would recommend that we ban Huawei. If I were the Prime Minister's Chief of Staff, I would say punt the decision. Punt the decision. But the, the yeah. job of the Prime Minister and of Cabinet is to look at the human rights record, look at trade, look at security, look at geostrategic issues, pull them all together and come up with a decision. Right now, if you put them all together, 
and I'm the chief of staff, which I will never be, I would say punt it a little bit. But having said that, that's very unfair to our private sector who don't know okay, one well, way or the Dick, other. Just let me just stick with you because Huawei released, Huawei Canada released this statement and they said in the 10 years of operating in Canada, we have never, there's never been a security incident. There's never been a lapse of any sort, not one. In other words, we have been great players for 10 years. Trust us then, trust us now. What do you make of that? I think it's unmitigated fooey. <laughs> a, we don't know what we don't know. Secondly, there may have been any number of breaches which the government of Canada has decided not to make public. But in any event, whether that happened or not in the past, it may not be happening now, and the future is totally unknown. So I think that's spurious. It's not a very good argument at all. I think also you have to take into account the difference between, let's say, 4G and 5G and why we're yeah. going for 5G. 5G mm. is about the Internet of Things, right? right? It is about connecting your toaster and your driveway heater and your car all at the same time. It's about the transmission of data at a rapid pace. The information that's going to flow over 5G is potentially so much more sensitive and so much more dangerous to lose than 4G. So it's possible, hey, under 4G, they weren't that interested. And under 5G, that's data they can really use and do something with. And I think it raises the question about what type of protections do we have in place for this 5G network? Whether it's Huawei, whether it's right. Nokia or Ericsson, do we have the necessary security precautions in place to make sure that no government can hack into any of the information like your toaster? Okay, so... If everything's connected, and we're talking about in the China file, in other words, the Huawei decision and what we're going to do with Meng Wanzhou in there, Tonda, what about now we're dealing with China on the coronavirus? We need cooperation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's a whole complexity where we've got to get Canadians out and keep them safe. Are strained relations now spilling over into actually the coronavirus situation. So that's a really interesting question and it's one that many MPs actually have asked of the government in a couple of mm. committees this past week. And to a person, the government officials have been saying and the, and the ministers as well have been denying that. Trudeau was asked it as well. And they, they don't say that they've paid any price in trying to access what they need to access in China. Uh, I think it's a legitimate question to ask, though, because uh, Canada has struggled and lagged behind other countries. But look, um, the, the, the whole relationship is fraught right now. It's on ice. We don't have half the, the working relationship that the U.S. or the U.K., for example, Japan even, right. has with China. So, look, we have to take them at their word for now. We don't have evidence to the contrary. Mm -hmm. My experience, though, in situations like that, we can have strategic difficulties with problems, but when humanitarian issues arise, by and large, they're separated. So I would tend to believe the, minis the ministers and the politicians. I, think too, you I can don't look know, back to but Iran. I think so. I mean, yeah. what happened with Iran yeah. recently in the wake mm -hmm. of the plane crash? If you consider that we have no diplomatic relations with Iran, as opposed mm. to tense diplomatic relations with China, and how relatively quickly you know our officials were in country assessing the damage, bringing back the remains, I think there's something to be said to Dick's point that humanitarian considerations factor in differently. And China has its reputation at stake here too, a yes. little bit, as the potential yeah. epicenter of more and yeah. more of these diseases. Well, well, it's about having a global economic plan. economic impact on that country exactly. is going to massive. Massive. Mass. 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 be massive. Uh, all right, uh, let me just take a short break. Before we go, I just want to s say something to Dick Fadden. He's the former National Security Advisor and head of CSIS. And so he's just dropping some complicated terms like unmitigated fooey. So we're just going to have to look <laughs> that out. All right, Dick, thank you so much. The rest of the scrum.